field of quantum chemistry, uh, ranging from theory development to applications. And he has been with us for the past five years now at Iser Kolkata as director. So we're very happy to welcome him here and would love to hear from him about the uh, uh, present and future of quantum chemistry and also about his work. Professor Pal? Yeah. You may please. Thank you. Yeah, let me share the screen first, I think. Uh, are these the, all the participants of the QIQT? Uh, no, I think they will join in new course of time. Actually, there are many more. Oh, uh, yeah, these are mostly chemistry, you know, students from the chemistry background. Okay. So, so let me share the screen, okay? Is it seen? Yes. Can you see the full screen? Uh, not yet. No? Uh, no, we still... Uh, uh, let me, let me try. Again. Can't yes. see, right? Now it's perfect. Is it moving? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, let me start uh, the talk by first thanking the organizers of the QIKT workshop. Of course, being at ISA Kolkata, I'm also kind of organizer only. So, I was, uh, but I'm happy to give this talk as uh, what we, why we need quantum computer in the quantum chemistry, which is now moving not only in the regime of quantum length scale, but also at the multiple length scale. So, and these multi-scale simulation requires com quantum computers. So let me first apologize saying that we are not the people who actually build quantum computers, but uh, we are uh, people who would be basically users of quantum computers once the quantum computer come, comes. So I think uh, that's the background that I would like to give to all the students and others who are present uh, in this QIQT workshop. Uh, let me thank Professor Paniglahi and Professor uh, Shangit Sen for inviting me here <coughs> for this particular talk. So it's a special talk because and we are not really in the core area of quantum information or quantum technology. So although the quantum information and quantum technology uh, rely on quantum mechanics, and we work more on the application of quantum mechanics to the chemistry, development of new approximations, algorithms, as well as applications. Uh, so let me say that I was, uh, uh, before I came to ISA Kolkata, I was at IIT Bombay, and then I am, uh, before that I was at National Chemical Laboratory Pune. So it's a great pleasure to uh, acknowledge all these institutions where I have worked, uh, particularly National Chemical Laboratory Pune, where I have spent 33 years of my career. And uh, some of the work that I will be presenting would actually be from the students of NCL as well, and not just at ISA Kolkata. Of course, in between for a very brief period, I was at IIT Bombay. And uh, so these are the three cities in which I live, Mumbai, Pune, and Kolkata. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, it has been a great time in each of these three cities. So let me first say that the ISA Kolkata is an institute of national importance. For those, I think I'm sure ISA Kolkata has been introduced well in this workshop. It was set up to have an integrated research with education. Its undergraduate science program is the flagship program, and that is called the BSMS program, which is basically a five-year program 
leading to master's degree. Uh, we have uh, basically the program focuses on interdisciplinary science and education. Am I audible now? Better? Sangeeta, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it has a focus of interdisciplinary research and education. And now it is almost 15 years, much more than a decade. Uh, ICERs have become a brand name for the education, uh, undergraduate science education in this country. Uh, just as IITs are, of course, brand for technology, IITs, NITs, and some of the central universities. So ICERs are the brand for the science. Uh, ICER Kolkata, I'm happy, was the first of the two to be set up in 2006, along with ICER Pune. And uh, I'm very happy to share that in last year, when we had our 15 years of anniversary, uh, Chemistry and Asian Journal, which is a very famous uh, journal of the Wiley publications that many of you know, the same Wiley which publishes Angewan Peshemi and various other great journals. So in that Chemistry Asian Journal had a very special issue on the research publications from ISR Kolkata and Pune. And I'm very happy that ISR Kolkata had a lion's share of the publications in that issue. And, and I thanks to all my colleagues in various departments, in particular in chemistry. So that was a great, uh, that was a great uh, way to celebrate the, the ISR Kolkata and ISR Pune. And I'm very happy that a journal like Chemistry and Asian Journal, which is a wily publication, very, very famous publication, decided to do that for an institution in India. I, I don't think this is very rare and this is very commonly done. So I, I have to hang Wiley uh, for doing that, for focusing ISA Kolkata in the world map. Yeah, let me say that uh, when we talk of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics has very often uh, been at the forefront of what is called the fundamental understanding. And the fundamental understanding uh, is uh, something that is required today, even for technology. So we always like to show this and the quantum technology is a great example of uh, what I'm trying to say in this particular slide. Very often we have fundamental understanding which remains only in the realm of pure research. Often we have applied chemistry, applied research, which remains purely in the applied research and not too much of a fundamental science. But what is very important is to reach the quadrant of Assure, which is basically use inspired basic research. So high science, uh, which has been applied uh, for great use. And in fact, I must say that the quantum technology is one such uh, very important part of this pasture quadrant. In fact, if I have to exemplify today what research qualifies under pasture quadrant, I think quantum technology is one of them because this has great understanding from fundamental quantum mechanics, which has been now applied to a technology of, of, of course, which the whole world is uh, looking for. So I think our idea is really to look, start from here and move into the pasture quadrant. And that is very, very difficult. And very often it has been difficult because uh, of the arrogance of the scientists themselves. And this is exemplified by this particular statement by C.P. Snow, who says we prided ourselves that the science that we are doing would not in any conceivable circumstances have any practical use. More firmly one could make that claim, the more superior one felt, which essentially means that people who are doing fundamental science, they were very proud that it will not have any practical use. And that has been the major bottleneck why we could not move to from bore to pasture quarter. And very often that has been the problem. Uh, in the context of uh, the science, this is a very, very important statement. It says that the more progress physical sciences make, the more they tend to enter the domain of mathematics, which is the kind of center to which they all converge. We may even judge the degree of perfection to which a science is arrived by the facility with which it may be submitted to calculation. So I think quantum mechanics is a great example again where the mathematics has converged. However, in the context of chemistry, there has been always a, a, a note of, I, I should say, this, not dissent, 
But a, a note which is somewhat on the contrary, in fact, this statement by Comte, again, another 200 years back, actually says that, that every attempt to employ mathematical methods in the study of chemical questions must be considered profoundly irrational and contrary to the spirit of chemistry. But today we know this is not right. And that is what I want to say, that with the advent of quantum mechanics, uh, the quantum chemistry has grown into a full-fledged discipline where uh, mathematics has been used and, 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 the, and the need of the quantum computer is more than ever before. Of course, the theoretical chemistry itself started long before the quantum chemistry came, though the quantum chemistry is often credited for the modern theoretical chemistry. But G. N. Lewis talked of uh, valence and tautomerism, the atom and the molecule. There's a very famous paper with G. N. Lewis, I must say, the atom and the molecule in Jacks 2000, sorry, 1916, I'm very sorry about this year, uh, about 100 years back. And of course, the, when he de developed the octet rule, G. N. Lewis's octet rule, and this is a very famous thing in G. N. Lewis. But remember when G. N. Lewis talked of chemical bonding based on eight valence electrons, uh, Lewis did not worry about quantum mechanics. In fact, I must say that 1916 quantum mechanics was just about beginning to come. It has still not come full-fledged. In fact, Bohr's atomic theory came 1913, which was really not quantum mechanics. But uh, the G. N. Lewis actually left the field when quantum mechanics came. And this was actually taken up by a very famous scientist called Linus Pauling. Uh, and this became a full-fledged valence bond theory. So G. N. Lewis talked of the valence and the structure of atoms and molecules. In fact, Lewis defined physical chemistry as everything that is interesting. And he talked of the theory of shared electron pair. So Lewis is, of course, a great person by himself. But his talk, talking of chemical bonding was actually before the quantum mechanics came. Of course, the fact that Lewis did not get Nobel Prize has been a great puzzle of Lewis's career. But I'm not going to go into G. N. Lewis's career here. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to say that Lewis was a person who talked of chemical bond. In fact, this is from the Lewis's own memorandum in 1902 where he was actually putting electrons on the corners of all these polyhedrons. And he showed that the cube structure, uh, if it is fully occupied, then it becomes a stable structure, which means all the eight corners are fully occupied, then it becomes this most stable structure. In fact, Lewis, it is very, very historical, uh, Lewis's own handwriting, as you can see uh, in this uh, particular thing. So he talked of ionic bond, he talked of covalent bond, he talked of metallic bond, so it is very interesting to uh, look at that. And the computational chemistry, however, today is mostly both based on first the quantum mechanics, which of course all of you know because you are, you are, you are at, uh, attending the QIQT workshop of the Schrodinger equation and solution of the Schrodinger equation. In fact, every information of every information of a system is actually contained in this uh, Schrodinger equation. However, one has to realize, and this is what I want to tell, that there has been a plethora of approximations, uh, which basically take the theories beyond quantum mechanics uh, for large systems. For example, uh, simple classical mechanics, which is uh, called molecular mechanics, where the energies are driven by force field or uh, based on atomic force field or coarse graining, which are based, based on a group of atoms, which are called beads, which is called coarse graining. So that has been a very important part of the area and forms today the part of what I call multi-scale simulation. Then there are empirical and statistical theories like QSAR, quantitative structure activity, relationship, et cetera, which are widely used in pharmaceutical or clinical chemistry. So I think many of these today form what is part of computational chemistry. I mean, it's very short to say that these three particular things, but I think broadly speaking, that these three areas really, uh, to me, uh, is theoretical chemistry. One is quantum chemistry, both structure and dynamics. In fact, there is a talk on the dynamics following this. Then there is a simulation, which is at large length scale. And then there are theories which can be called informatics. This is basically informatics, quant chemoinformatics, bioinformatics, and so on. Many of these come under the empirical theories. So I think in a way, the theoretical chemistry is very, very broad today. 
But we, of course, will focus on the quantum mechanics because this is a topic on QIQ. The important thing that I want to mention is that the computational chemistry has become a very important arm to find a solution. A solution which is obtained by combination of theory, experiment, and computation. But what we require is not just the skills, and this is something that I always keep telling to uh, the budding scientists, that the many people are enamored, many people are absolutely enamored by their skills, and they want to apply the skill, their skills to every single problem. However, one has to realize that the solution of every problem is probably not, to, not going to come from your skill, but a combination of skills, not just from your skill. So this is the important thing which is going to lead to the solution. And we must look at the solution rather than the application of what I know. Unfortunately, the science is always going in this manner, the application of what I know. And this is particularly true in our country, but I think globally people are realizing what is important is the solution. And to get the solution, people do collaborate. People do reach out to other people. And I, I think this is, a, this is a very, very important thing that in India, it must happen. Uh, I will not worry about the definition of theoretical versus computational chemistry. I will skip these slides. But I just want to say one thing that there has been a lot of discussion of what is theoretical and what is computational chemistry. Theoretical chemistry is that part of the physics, uh, which is basically a, a, a development of mathematical description of physics, development of uh, algorithms, whereas computational chemistry is uh, application of a well-developed mathematical method. So in theoretical chemistry, uh, the phys chemists, physicists, and mathematicians develop, whereas in computational chemistry, they may simply apply existing programs and methodologies, but they must apply to specific chemical questions. I think that is very important, uh, which will lead to a solution. Uh, <clears throat> modern theoretical chemistry, the quantum chemistry, of course, starts with this very famous paper, and I must give credit to this paper by Walter Heitler, and Fritz London in 1927, when they first gave the, the quantum mechanics of chemical bond of the hydrogen molecule. And this was done through what was known at that time as valence bond theory, uh, which actually Linus Pauling uh, did a lot of work on and eventually got Nobel Prize in 1953. Yeah, something like that. I, I don't exactly remember, but around 1953. Uh, so I think I think I've already explained what is the difference between theoretical chemistry and and, and uh, experimental computational chemistry. But important thing is that the theoreticians try to connect the theory, develop the theory to connect to laboratory data. Laboratory data is very often the real data, which is called the experimental data. But we often try to develop quantities which are less real using theory. And that is something that is not understood. For example, bond length, bond angle, vibrational frequency, potential energy curve, molecular orbital, transition state, they're actually unreal because very often you don't find them by experiment directly. Experiments give something and the theory actually connects them indirectly to these quantities but they are not directly measured. I mean, nobody will directly measure a transition state, but from the transition state, you calculate quantities which can be theoret experimentally verified. I think that is very important. So experiment data are real, but very often when you do fitting or interpret by theory, they are somewhat less real. I'm not saying they are not real, but they're less real. It's very difficult to, ex to exemplify more than this. For example, a bond distance. You don't get bond distance by experiment. You actually get a spectral data like NMR, X-ray, rotational result from which bond distance is fitted. So vibrational spacing is also used to fit and obtain dissociation energy. But you don't get dissociation energy directly. You get from the vibrational energy, activation energy. Similarly, charge of an atom and molecule. So there are many situations uh, which distinguish in a very subtle way the theoretical uh, theory, well, how the theory is done. There are a lot of interesting work which has been done. I talked about one of them before even the computer scan. The reason we are talking about theoretical chemistry before computers, that while we will 
speech for quantum computers, people must understand a lot of things has happened even before the computers came. So Heitler and London's paper, which is basically pen and pencil paper, and then very minor work, which can be done by calculator those days, uh, was published in 1927. Born Oppenheimer, Molecule, also Oppenheimer's very, very famous paper in 1927, where actually showed how uh, the Born Oppenheimer approximation can be used to define the electronic structure in a fixed nuclear. And then what happens, of course, with Born Oppenheimer approximation breaks down, that might be the content of the second lecture today. Uh, and then Huckel, very early numbers, Huckel uh, did a lot of qualitative things, approximation, Mullikan, many of these electron affinity, molecular orbital, dipole moment, they were all uh, developed when the computer still not came, uh, still not, did not still come. Hybridization, Eiling's transition state, you know, I can keep giving examples, uh, uh, which really happened uh, before the computers. I must say at this point that computers came around 1940s in a big way. So I think many people say 1940s is kind of a watershed uh, in the computer. So it, it's very important to realize uh, the computer uh, revolution came at the 1940s. You know, it's a very uh, loose way of saying you can argue this is not debatable. So theoretical chemistry after the computers came, one of the great work that was done by uh, Rosenblum, Taylor, Metropolis, which is known as the Metropolis simulation, which is very, very important work. And then, of course, Ruthan, they did Ruthan and Hall, they did the molecular orbital theory, very, very important work of Ruthan uh, is something that we should not forget. And that actually started the uh, uh, molecular orbital theory in some, in some sense that was very, very important uh, that uh, the Ruthan's work. I must mention this, uh, that today, you know, many people do not realize what Ruthan did, but without Ruthan's work, uh, molecular orbital theory in quantum chemistry would not have come. Of course, MJS Dewar was a very famous person. Uh, and, and then there are many people, like I, I talked to Pauling incidentally, uh, Pauling, uh, I was trying to remember when Pauling got the first Nobel Prize. He actually got it in 1954, not 53. 1954 is when he got the Nobel Prize for his chemical bond. And then he got a second Nobel Prize for peace. So Linus Pauling was a great person. Anyway, continuing this, Carr and Parinello's work in 1985, Carr plus Martin Carr plus, and this is something very, very important. Martin Carr plus started working on dynamics of folded proteins using high length scale approximation that I was talking of. David Chandler, uh, David Chandler's work. And then of course, eventually couple cluster came, which today has become the gold standard of quantum chemistry. Very accurate, very accurate calculations and gives you numbers. Uh, but then it's so accurate that it requires fast computer. And I'm going to pitch for the quantum computers in the context of the couple cluster in particular. More work by Peter Poole, uh, Ken uh, Fukui's intrinsic reaction coordinates, Warsell's uh, mixing of two different length scale. In fact, this is the beginning of what is called the multi-scale simulation. In the same system, uh, Warsell used quantum mechanics as well as classical molecular mechanics. There are, of course, in between work by Woodward and Huffman, which actually told how to not even use computer. I must say this, some basic rules about the computer by simply looking at the conservation of orbital symmetry. So there has been a lot of discussion in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that how much we can do without the computers, without the use of big computers. But today, of course, we know that the computers are essential. I must, of course, mention this Dirac's famous statement that with this Schrodinger equation, everything that we had to know is known. It's a very, very generalized statement Everything that is known, all these exact applications leads to equation much too complicated to the solution. And this is the reason we require quantum computers. What is interesting is that the quantum computer themselves are developed because of quantum mechanics. So I think there are two very important parts that I'm talking. I am more focusing on the application of quantum mechanics, which requires quantum computers. But one has to realize that the quantum mechanics itself gave rise to quantum computers. So it's very interesting 
that the devil, devil gives you the solution to solve the devil's problem. I think this is what I would say, that the quantum mechanics has given you the solution to solve the problems of application of quantum mechanics, which is very, very difficult. Uh, and, and today I must say, using this computational chemistry can do almost everything from small molecules, 3D crystals and everything. So what cannot be done in the computers is something that you can question. We are only limited by supercomputers. And this is the, exactly the reason I'm saying that the quantum computers will, will, will give us the solution. We can get the structure, we can get the dynamics, we can get the reactivity. And several properties, I will not go to list down all the properties, energy, dipole moment, orbital energy, electron distribution, vibrational frequencies, and so on, reaction pathways, energetics, intermediates. In fact, if you look at it, you may wonder what cannot be done by computer. Shapes of molecules, their properties, including large biomolecular properties. And at the same time, great experiments have come up. Today, people have characterization tools, analytical tools, uh, which can actually look at small molecules, you can lose, look at large molecules, uh, like mass spec, LCMS, NMR, and for large biomolecules, ELISA, for example, for biology, so many experimental uh, tools have been developed that I think it's become almost concurrent that the theory has to, has to go into that level. However, the problem is exemplified here and why the need for the quantum computer. So let me say that I assume a typical computing setup and I'm looking at basically the first three lines are quantum mechanics. The fourth line I've already explained is molecular mechanics, classical simulation. Just to give you an example, if you do a very good quantum mechanics of solution of the Schrodinger equation, including which actually may go up to the couple cluster, it will require from n to the power four, which is basically the basic method of Hartree fog, to the couple cluster triples, which can go up to n to the seven, n to the eight. There are approximations which are very, very famous, which is known as the couple cluster singles, doubles, bracket triples, approximate triples, which scales as n to the seven. So you can imagine what it is. Whereas if we use the quantum mechanics, but not solving the Schrodinger equation, but a method which is very popular where energy is directly written as a function of density is called DFT. That goes up to n to the four. Semi-empirical methods which are completely outdated, which also solves the web function, but in, a, in an approximate way where experimental inputs are taken, they scale as n to the three, and the molecular mechanics scales as n to the power two. So you can see in a typical setup, the time with which you can do 100 atoms, we can do 1,000 at 100 atoms is just an example. It's n to the five, actually. You can do 1,000 atoms. You can do 10,000 atoms. You can do 100,000 atoms. The same computer time. So you must choose your methods depending on the system. And that is what I call horses for the courses approach. That means depending on the horse course, you choose your horse. Depending on the system, you choose your method because you are limited by the computer. What would ideally we would like is even for 100,000 atom, I would ideally like to have a system of couple cluster singles, doubles, triples, or bracket triples, which will end to the power seven at least, if not more. That is what ideally I would like because this is very accurate. I can't do because I don't have computer. So I hope you realize what can quantum computer can do? The quantum computer, I can pick up systems like 100,000 atoms and do couple cluster. And that's the need today to be very, very accurate. So this is a very, very accurate method. CCSD, I would say approximate CCSDT, not exactly full CCSDT, but the problem is n to the power seven scaling. We can we can do even multi-reference versions of couple cluster to do lots of nice chemistry on excited states, electron attached, ionization, potential surface. I'm not gonna talk much about these details of the theory, but we can do very good chemistry at high accuracy. However, computational limitations force one to make approximations. And that is when we go to even down to molecular mechanics. So we have to somehow solve it. So this is the problem of the quantum mechanics that it's, a, it's a really a qualitative 
curve showing the size versus accuracy. The most accurate methods is full configuration interaction, very few atoms. And then as the accuracy decreases, of course, this essentially means inaccuracy in terms of kilocalorie per mole. If that is increasing, accuracy is decreasing, you can go to some empirical methods like thousand atoms and so on. So that's the problem. We want big systems to be done accurately. Okay, that is not possible. I again repeat that, unless you have quantum chemistry. I, I, I will, I will uh, simply exemplify this further with this particular slide, horses for the courses approach. But depending on the length scale, we have different types of methods. We have quantum mechanics, we have molecular simulation or molecular mechanics, we have mesoscale simulation, which I call coarse graining, where a group of atoms form a bead and one bead interacts with another bead and so on. So, I think you can, you can choose between atomistic and coarse grain, but this is like, uh, you know, my friend says, forest versus tree. You can see a tree, you can see a forest at a different, at a larger length scale, and the trees are often not visible. It depends on what you want to do. Ideally, we would like to look at, look at every single part of a big system, and that would require very good quantum mechanics, which is not possible today without the kind of computers that we require. The same goes for nanomaterials. I'm not going to worry about nanomaterials much, but even for nanomaterials, we have a large number of atoms and we require very big systems. In fact, I, I want to tell you a very, very famous statement by Strodinger in 1952, when he said we would never experiment with one electron atom or molecule. And 1968 years after Richard Feynman said, there are no physical limitations to arranging atoms the way we want. So you can see how things change. And within 20 years, STM, scanning tunneling microscope came. Then of course, the IBM Zurich lab 86, atomic force microscope came. And it changed the way thing people have looking at the system today at the microscopic level, which is impossible to do. I change gear to say how quantum computer actually tries to solve the problem. Although, as I said, I'm not an expert on devising quantum computer, quantum devices, but I must say that quantum computer uses quantum mechanics and that is where our interest lies. And there are of course experts who must have come and talked about all the quantum technology. But the important thing is to realize that all quantum information is held it is quantum in, in, in the physical information that is held in the state of a quantum system. So let's say I take a two-state system. In a classical system, it, there'll be two bits, zero and one. And in a quantum system, there will be combination of two states, zero and one. And this combination is very interesting because in the combination, I can actually generate many, many states. Even though there are two linearly independent states, I can generate many states by the quantum. For a classical, I have only zero and one. And this uh, leads to what is called the qubit, quantum bit today. And examples, atomic levels, let's say n, n plus one, there are spin states of two states, alpha and beta. There are two polarization, vertical and horizontal. Uh, but the important thing is that we can actually generate, uh, generate many, many states. So the whole idea in quantum mechanics is this, the linear combination the superposition of states, which are basically non-stationary states. And I think those are the ideas through which uh, the quantum computers has been developed. And that has been the qubit. For example, there could be more qubits, zero and one put together, two qubits. So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So I can have now a linear combination of the four states just because I have two, two bits, two qubits. So I have linear combination of four states, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. Each of them is a, you can say like a stationary state. And I'm making a combination, a superposition of these four states to generate many states. So I can have n qubits, zero, 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 one, one, and so many. With zero and one itself, I can make n qubits. And this is basically called the quantum entanglement by which the passing of information from A to B is, is enabled. So it's very important to realize this. 
So quantum computer in very short uses quantum mechanical phenomena of superposition and entanglement to perform operations on data. So you actually generate several uh, memory so that that can, that can make the quantum computing very easy. Quantum computers can thus solve problems which are much faster than the classical computers. Quantum computers can simulate uh, much faster than the classical computers. And, and what is important is that they're reversible and can save energy. And this is something that is really very engineering that the quantum computers use much less energy than the classical computers. One gives an example how quantum computers can solve so given an integer, let's say given an integer n, you would like to know its prime factors, how many prime factors it has got. If you use a classical computer, it will be two to the power, some order of ln n to the power one by three. That's an order statement, but it has two to the power that. Now that's very large as n goes up. Look at the computer, quantum computer. It is just of the order of ln n square. There is no power here. And, and, and that makes it much simpler in the quantum computer. So these are, of course, mathematicians can actually calculate this very easily and, and, and depending on, on, on the computer that you have. So this is, the, this is the CPU that is required. And of course, depending on the computer it has, it might actually solve the problem. How many bits you have got? If you do unsorted database search, given a, find a given element in a database of size n, Classically, it will be order of n. In quantum computer, the order will become n to the power half. So I think you can see how uh, the, the things are becoming more and more easy. So Feynman made a very important statement. Classical computers require exponential time to simulate many particle problems. So a particle problem and, and exponential time, very often factorial. Quantum computers require a polynomial time. This is a very simple way to understand that, of course, it is not linear in n, but it's a polynomial in it, the time that is required. Whereas in the classical computers, you may require exponential time. We actually do a complete simulation. And that, that is the heart of the solution that I can say that why quantum computers uh, suddenly uh, solve, solve the problem. Today, what is the present state? It's a very important to realize this is a technical part, which I think engineers or technologists will be able to elaborate. But the problem is to control and couple the individual qubits. I was talking of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3 qubits, 4 qubits, n bits, and so on. If you have to couple them, actually, when you make a device, and that is an engineering problem. And today's state is that people are still running algorithm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is 10, 20 today. I don't know. But typically of that order, 10, 20, 30 qubits the computers which are actually available to you. What is required to beat the present classical supercomputers is actually 10,000, 100,000 qubit this computer. So you can see we are very far off. And while we are very excited about quantum computers, that's one of the challenges is that how fast we can reach these such that the computer can beat all the present day computers. I, I, I actually solve, not just beat, actually I should say, solve the problems that we want. I think one can beat the classical, best classical computers with less number of qubits, but what we require today is to solve the Schrodinger equation for large systems, nanomaterials, is really 10,000, 100,000 qubit this computer. And, and I should say the quantum mechanics seems to be very simple that you do linear combination. The problem is actually confronting them, coupling them, and, and getting a solution. And this is an engineering problem, technological problem, which I'm sure the quantum technologists will be able to explain why this is difficult. Uh, I think I will, uh, because of lack of time, uh, I will probably very quickly talk about the research that we are doing and which will simply highlight the need of a quantum computer. Uh, uh, as I said, I am primarily working on electronic structure of molecules. Uh, as I said, the quantum mechanics has two very important aspects, structure and dynamics. So I'm looking at electronic structure of molecules. 
And in particular, we are developing bound state couple cluster methods and very recently for resonance and decay problem, but we have worked a lot on the molecular properties, including relativistic, including relativistic effects. Uh, I also have worked on non-iterative approximation of density functional response for large systems, uh, qualitative reactivities like local hardness, softness, uh, as a descriptors for molecules, and then uh, like hard soft acid base. And then of course, a lot of interesting applications on material science, including catalysis by zeolite, metal catalysis, computational study of hydrogen storage materials, gold and aluminum clusters as catalytic and functional materials and so on. So very quickly, uh, some of the highlights that we have been working on is to develop, and this is very important in the, in the context of quantum computers, is to develop a Hermitian, because you all know that we require Hermitian quantum mechanics in the quantum computers, to develop a Hermitian uh, average value for energy, but in, within the couple cluster, because couple cluster is very, very accurate. However, there are a lot of problems and the major problem is that this series is non-truncating and we have to do a force truncation and that force truncation leads to what is called the size extensivity loss. So the size extensivity is a very important property where energy scales as proportional to n. Very early days we did this and then we found that the expectation value is not a good idea. We went to what is called the extended couple cluster with an additional set of de-excitation the form of uh, amplitude, but that is not the problem. The problem is that this became non hermitian unlike the expectation value, but this is completely truncating and fully size extensive. So it is good. So one has to look at how do you do similar thing, but with the Hermitian function. And I think that has been a major focus. One can of course brute force Hermitize, but that is not where, what we are talking in a very natural way, a Hermitian thing. Uh, we went to various other things where static correlation was taken by multi-reference methods of the couple cluster, uh, which could solve ionization potential, affinity, excitation energy, molecular response, and, and very related equation of motion couple cluster. But comparison, we also did a lot of work on that. Uh, we also looked at low scaling couple cluster approximation because we don't have quantum computers. So we have to always do low, low scaling. Uh, from n power six to make n power five and so on uh, with certain approximations. Uh, as I said, we looked at the resonance and decay problem with couple cluster and for that we required add the addition of a complex absorbing potential because that addition makes the wave function square integrable. It's very, very important to realize that our couple cluster works only when you have a square integrable wave function, which is the hallmark of the bound state method. However, when you do resonance and decay or there are very new experiments of interatomic Coulombic decay. These are not uh, square integrable wave functions. So how do you do that? You make cap and with the cap, one can show that the imaginary, there is the imaginary part, which is the decay and the real part of the complex uh, energy becomes the resonance energy. So one can show that we did a lot of work on this. And then of course, I talked of the relativistic methods, very, very, uh, interesting work in his spin orbit coupling and all relativistic effects have been done for again very very different properties so that we can identify methods like mercury hydride radium fluoride as very with a very very high degree of uh, accuracy so this is something that i have written uh, also i mean this is a repetition of the slide but i just want to mention that very recently we are also looking at electron nuclear scalar pseudo scalar interaction in lead fluoride very interesting uh, example that we have got uh, uh, by using uh, relativistic effects. So in terms of materials, of course, you require, again, big computers. So I, I just want to quickly show some interesting results. The gold and silver clusters have been used for oxygen activation and CO oxidation reaction. Uh, and we have found that if you just put a hydrogen atom chemisoc, gold cluster or silver cluster, the hydrogen atom really helps in uh, uh, this oxidation reaction. Uh, then aluminum nanoclusters have been, we have shown for oxidative addition of a carbon halide bond, which is very important, as you know, for a carbon-carbon uh, bond formation. Uh, then we looked at endohedrally go, dope gold clays for efficient O2 activation. I'm gonna show some example. 
uh, radical attached aluminum cluster, again, aluminum cluster. This is a very interesting uh, catalyst that we have found. Alum small aluminum clusters on boron nitride dope graphene. So you have a graphene, you put BN dope, and then aluminum cluster. And this can actually activate even dinitrogen molecule. This is a very, very important problem to go from dinitrogen to ammonia. Uh, this was published in a paper in Physical Chemistry, Chemical Physics in 2016. A lot of interesting work. Very recently, we are doing catalysis design for using several, not just metal, organometallics in particular, pre-catalysts, co-catalysts, several metals we have been doing. Uh, in particular, we are looking at homogeneous catalysis for CO2 activation, uh, for CO2 to formate and formic acid. Uh, I just talked about this metal catalyst. Uh, I, I, I talked about gold and silver catalyst in particular. One of the interesting catalysts is AU8. Very small gas first catalyst, but this is itself inert. But as soon as you do one AU by silicon atom, it becomes catalytic acid. And this is the beautiful thing about the cluster chemistry that change of one atom completely changes the catalytic properties. Pristine gold cage. I told you about that. AU18 by itself, it is not a great catalyst. But as soon as you put a metal inside the cage, it becomes catalyst. I talked of hydrogen atom chemisol. Aluminum cluster for dinitrogen, very interesting work. Uh, and I want to show one of them, one or two of them. So for example, if you look at pristine AU18 gold cage, uh, this is a very big calculation where you look at the entire reaction coordinate and the intermediate and transition state. You start from the CO and oxygen, you get a CO2, and you look at the activation barriers. The barriers are 0.71 and 0.45 EV of the two transition states. If you do the same thing, with the sodium inside, the same gold cage, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, you can see all the barriers come down, which essentially means that this oxidation process becomes enabled, catalytically active. This has been shown here by the hydrogen chemist up, the other catalyst that I talked about. I took AU6 and AU8, pristine gold clusters. If you look at the barrier for CO oxidation, it's a very high barrier. AU6 gives 0.721 AV, AU8 even gives 1.193. And this is the binding energy. As soon as you put one hydrogen, you can see the binding energy increases. So with uh, O2, and more importantly, the bond is getting stretched from 1.23 to 1.32, 1.23 to 1.32. And, and at the same time, the barriers are almost reduced to nil. You can see 0.721 EV has almost become barrierless. 1.193 AD is also reduced to 0.360. So of course, from here, you can also infer that AU6 is better than AU8. That is true. As I told you, AU8 is inert. I have not tried what will happen if I do SiAU7 and H. Because I already told you, SiAU7 is catalytically active. So maybe if I put a hydrogen chemisorb and SiAU7, this will be even better than this AU8. I think something that I have to do, there are a lot of things one can keep doing, uh, calculation. I'm also looking at uh, density functional application for batteries using molybdenum sulfide and tungsten sulfide, very recent works that we have been doing, a lot of interesting work that we have done uh, in recent, uh, recent thing. So both lithium and sodium ion battery, blue phosphorin, uh, this can also give a very good storage uh, capacity. So a lot of interesting work I've done with my student, Gayatri Barik, uh, and, and, and blue phosphorin and, and molybdenum sulfate. Uh, together, we have done a heterostructure, and uh, this also gives very good results. So in fact, with molybdenum sulfide, tungsten sulfide, blue phosphorin, graphene, we're trying to make a lot of interesting combination to see what works in the... Uh, in the regime of anode materials for battery. Uh, since I'm coming to the end of the last few minutes, let me close with the outlook. What I have essentially showed is that a, a fundamental insight from an atomic and molecular level to nanoscale and bulk. Today, it is possible to look at systems which are nanoscale. Systems which are like protein, nanometers, and so on. Can we we today make approximations. Can we look at those from a very fundamental atomic and molecular view? That will require quantum mechanics. And, and uh, it is not possible to do that 
uh, today with today's uh, computers. Of course, today we do that with the horses for the courses approach. I showed that you can use different theoretical methods in the current computer because that's the best we can do. But ideally, I would like to use a much higher level theory to uh, develop this. So path forward would be to develop accurate methods for large systems. So one of the things that models that people can develop is a fragmentation approach. Of course, you can develop a better multi-scale simulation, approximations which are better. You need also to do strong correlation in molecules and solid. That is a very big challenge because this almost requires you to go to a full CI regime, full configuration interaction, which is very, very computationally challenging. We are also looking at using artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, into many of those problems, AI and ML, and eventually go to material genomics. Material properties, just like we have done genomics for our life, we can have material genomics. I think these are very, very important path forward. So of course, I'm not saying that theory should stop and theory should only look for big computers. A lot of theoretical developments should happen, but at the same time, we should have developments for the computer. So that is something that I want to end with. Uh, great, great big computers to allow good theories to now be applicable to better and bigger and bigger systems with bigger, better and better accuracy. So that's what we want. Everything good, theory good, approximations to be developed, good computers, and really good applications, reliable applications such that we can go from fundamental science to a computing science and generation of technology. And that is why I am saying it's a quantum technology. Indeed, it's a technology, but I'm looking at, and today people look at science and technology separately, but from the fundamental science, you can go to technology. And the computer theory would be so accurate that one can predict the experiments. That is very important. There are, of course, challenges in terms of theory, which I've listed down, including non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. I think there would be, a, the next talk is probably going to focus on that, I'm not sure, but that's going to focus on non-adiabatic molecular dynamics. In the context of DFT, I have put down improvement of the exchange correlation functional, because this is not a question of just computer problem. This is a question of really theoretical problem. So you must have, of course, theory. I mean, I must say that uh, I'm not going to give you an idea that if I have computer, everything is solved. Of course, you must have a theory first. If your theory is bad, good computers, quantum computer is not going to give good results. Of course, there is one theory for electronic structure that you can always use, full CI. You don't care, DFT or anything. But that would be really uh, not the right thing to do. So you must have whatever theory, whatever physics is available to us, you must first use and then look at big computers to scale it up so that you do use quantum computers for the right things and don't waste your computer time. So machine learning is also available today. So many of the catalysis design, material genomics can also be machine learning, can be even for computer coding, like non adiabatic molecular dynamics, strong correlated system, machine learning can be used. So a lot of people have been using machine learning. I think those techniques are very, very important. And none of these I'm suggesting should be stopped because we have quantum computers. First of all, quantum computers are still a dream, but a combination of good computer, good theory will lead us to the dream of fundamental science giving you technology. And I think that, that is where I will end. Of course, there are acknowledgement of various sources. Many of my students, some of the work that I presented has been done by Indo-European Union project, SCRB, DST, Indo-French, and many funding agencies. And of course, students, you know, that is very hard. I had more than at least 40, 45 students in my life who have done PhD from National Chemical Lab, IIT Bombay, of course, a bulk, bulk of them from National Chemical Lab, Pune. And I, I must say, much of my work started from there. Uh, where I really grew up. So I, I'm emotionally connected as far as my research is concerned, concerned to NCL Pune. And of course, eventually those work also moved to IIT Bombay. And today, uh, I'm very happy to be at ISA Kolkata in a very, very good educational environment to continue to do research. And I'm, I'm very grateful to my colleagues 
at ISR Kolkata that be, even being director, uh, they have given me, they have afforded me time to do research. And I think that's very important because many directors don't get time. Uh, at NCL, since I grew up, even though I was director, it was not a problem, but in a new place, it could have been a problem. But I'm very happy to say that in my fifth year that uh, I have been able to do, spend sufficient time, good time. Oh, sufficient is always a questionable uh, word, but a good time to do research at Isaac Colton. With that, I will again thank uh, Professor Panigrahi to, for inviting me in this QIQT workshop. And uh, I, as I told in the beginning, I'm not an expert on quantum technology, uh, but we of course uh, know quantum mechanics and apply quantum mechanics to quantum chemistry. And I could highlight why we require com quantum computers. I hope that at least I've been able to highlight the need for quantum computer and also very briefly tell you what is the present state of the quantum computer. I think with this, I thank all of the organizers again and hand it back to Sangeeta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pal, for a very enlightening and uh, wide overview of the subject. The floor is now open for questions. Uh, there are some on chat, uh, so I can uh, read them out for you. So the first question is, what type of gauge system is used in quantum computing? Actually, I have seen in one journal, but I can't understand. Yeah, so I think, yeah, this is something that is probably what I said, that it's a technical question, is quantum computing people will be able to say, because of course, you know, there are standard gates which are used in computing classical thing like logical gates, but I'm sure those are probably not going to be used for quantum computing because quantum computing will rely on uh, a linear combination of those. So I, I'm pretty sure that it is not just the same gate system that is used in quantum computing. Uh, but I think more than that, that uh, probably an expert will be able to tell what gate exactly is used. Yeah, uh, the next this second. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh... Kindly suggest some important papers on coupled clusters. Yeah, I think if you're interested, yeah, I mean, any of us can do that. It's hard for me to write uh, all of it today, but I will say there are review articles. And one of the important review articles which came up uh, very early is Annual Review of Physical Chemistry in 1981 by uh, Rodney Bartlett. There was a paper, of course, the original paper came from Jerry Chizek in Journal of Chemical Physics, 1966. And there was a review article in Advances in Chemical Physics uh, in 1969. And I think these are some of the early papers. And then when you come to multi-reference, there are several other papers which came up in the 80s, including Fox Space, Hilbert Space, multi-reference. So I think it's a long list, but if you're interested, uh, Eram Abedin, you know, can you write to me? I will send you by email uh, the, all the uh, uh, paper references, okay? Uh, okay, so next question is from Nandini Monbud. Thank you, sir, for the nice talk. Is the coupling you are talking about yeah. something connected to multipartite entangled state? Yes, 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 it's something like this. So a coupling is basically entangled, but there is a device coupling. When you are doing the qubit coupling, there would be a coupling with the devices, but suddenly uh, the coupling that we use here for the entangled states, it is somehow connected to that. I mean, it is connected, but it is not exactly the same because we are here talking about the bits being coupled, the coupling that I talked about, but there is a coupling also in terms of the different states coupling, which is, which is entangled states. Yes. Uh, okay, then the next question is from Srinivasa Desikan B. Uh, thanks, Professor Thorpal, for your wonderful talk. What is the accuracy level of transition state in CO2 releasing reaction either on cluster or nano? Yeah, so 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 it doesn't matter on what cluster and nano. The whole issue is that uh, what is the method that you're using? That is the most important thing. The accuracy level will not depend on the system but on the method that you are using. For transition state, for large system that you are talking of, today we are actually bound to use density functional theory, DFT. So the DFT, the problem with the transition state is, again, it depends on what functional you're using. So if you do not use a proper functional, you will not be able to get it. If you use at least hybrid functional, 
the structure of the transition state comes out reasonably accurate. However, if you want to get know the transition energy, which is basically the activation energies, you need to be much more accurate. You probably need to use what are called the Minnesota functionals, MO5, MO6 functionals, which in a way use Hartree-Fock exchange and not just uh, improvement by GGA uh, method and so on. So it is, it is using Hartree-Fock exchange, which is actually added to it, some percentage of Hartree-Fock exchange. And those functionals are very, very good in terms of uh, giving you energy. They, they take care of dispersion effects and so on. Uh, I'm also told that the Stefan Grimes dispersion corrected density functional theory is also very good in giving the transition state uh, right. So I think it's not important uh, on the CO2 releasing reaction. It's important, of course, it's important what system it is. If the system is very big, cluster or nanomaterials, uh, you have to use good, good, good functional. When you use VAS, of course, it, uh, it's a basis set which is different. But the functional still have to be good. So you can use Minnesota functional also on VAS, but you have to remember that they are very, very time consuming. The accuracy level that you are asking, yeah, would be of the order of few one, two, two kilocalorie per mole. And I think that is what I would expect. Anything uh, worse than that would probably not be acceptable. Because you have to remember for transition state, a few kilocalorie per mole increase, it's an exponential increase because, it, because uh, you have an exponential minus delta E by KT. That's the heart of the theory. So a small increase in delta E will actually decrease the reaction rate drastically in an exponential manner. So 20 kilocalorie per mole is good for room temperature. If you go to 30, then probably you have to heat it up to 100 degrees centigrade and so on. I mean, I mean you can do the calculation and see. So, so, so that's why the accuracy is, you are right, ex extremely important, one or two kilocalorie. And of course, you are right that depending on the materials, your functional has to be good, your computer has to be good. But today's computer, I would say, we are still trying to look at the accuracy level of whether CO2 releasing reaction or reduction reaction. Uh, we are looking at one to two kilocalorie per mole. That's the kind of accepted level of accuracy. I mean, if you can get better, it's always good. Okay. Yeah, so there are some new. Up, uh, with a question, yeah. is there any possibility of IRC calculation for VAS? Not sure. Yes, it is possible. In fact, many people think that the IRC calculation cannot be done on pass. That is not true. IRC calculation can also be done on pass, except that it is uh, much more time consuming. And many people, uh, that's why many people do not do it. In the, you will see that most of the vast base papers, the IRCs are not done. But it is not true. I have talked with some of the experts in the past. It is not true that it cannot be done. Uh, I think Santanu Devnath, I already explained that this get exact gate system, I'll not be able to tell in the quantum computing, but it will be different from the classical gate, that's for sure. Uh, I think this is a question which will, I'm sure would be answered by people who are working on quantum technology. Uh, there is a, another question by Srinivasa Desikan. Uh, while using Gaussian versus what TS, well, uh, yeah, I mean, TS accuracy is better in Gaussian. That's the summary that I can say yeah, but it depends on what functional you're using. You see, there is no single answer to this question. Because if you use a, not a good functional for Gaussian, so it depends on what functional you're using, what is your basis set? So you are forgetting one thing, that in the VASP also there is a basis set. It's a different kind of basis set, right? So, so the, the levels and cutoff points and so on. And what is the basis set in Gaussian? Without that, this question is too general. Even if you use same functional, if that is what you are saying. But in today's computer, of course, which are very well developed computer, the, you, you, you are more confident of getting a TS accuracy using Gaussian mm -hmm. than in the past. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Paul, for taking the time to answer all the questions. Uh, I see that there are no more questions. Yeah, I think there's only one question that I, that should be asked. What is the get oh, system? There is a very big question now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me see. 
Did I read it out? No, no, no. Don't, don't, no, I, I can read it. <laughs> chemical industry, since many different chemicals, starting from the bars, specialty chemical, processed here, even though not much a market. Why industry not currently developing new industrial processes through competition chemistry? All right. So I think summary of this that uh, why we are not designing new reactors such that the Indian industries become more cost effective is that I think that's the meaning of the question. Let me tell you. First of all, computational chemistry has to give such uh, design. As of now, I don't think we have a confidence using computational chemistry to give a new design to the chemical industries, which will definitely do a better job. I don't think that is possible yet. So that confidence level is missing. The second is that even if we do, the chemical industries have to look at their cost. Remember, when you do a completely new design, they may have to change what is called the capital. They may have to change the entire design, which will entail a large capital expenditure, what is called capex. I hope you know, since you are asking this question, you know there is something called capex and opex. Opex is operational expenditure. Capex is capital expenditure. So you require a large amount of capital expenditure. And many industries may not be able to do that. And I have been telling that to the government. In fact, there was a, a very important meeting of directors of all IIT ISAs uh, with the Rashtrapati in last uh, two, three days back. And one of the comments that I wanted to make was that uh, it's very nice to do research and innovation to help industries. But unless uh, we can help the industries to generate that amount of capex to go to a new design, it's never going to be feasible. The industries don't have that much money in India. Why don't they have money? Because they, they don't make that much business. And chemical industries in particular is going through a huge problem because they have to compete with China. So China is doing things much cheaper. You have to understand. So, so for example, you look at CO2 to dimethyl carbon, so DMC. It's a very, very important chemical. And in fact, I, I was looking at this kind of project as a director in National Chemical Lab Pune, I realized that the DMC price is so cheap in China that to come up with a process, make it work in India is not easy. And this is the problem in chemical industry. So today you talk of CO2 to methanol. We are looking at various complex, organometallic complex. In fact, I myself have a computational chemistry project, computational chemistry and synthesis project of imprint looking at a catalysis to do CO2 reduction. But remember, the, uh, uh, the CO2 methanol price that you get is very, very important. Today's catalysis can get CO2 to methanol at 130 rupees, uh, I don't know, 130 rupees per kg. Whereas even by conventional mill, methanol is available less than 40 rupees per kg. So unless you come from 130 to 140 to 40, it doesn't matter. You can do a lot of interesting publications, but you have to make it happen. And that is a part of the problem. Whereas formic acid and formate is easier to do. Methanol is a big challenge, I can tell you. Anybody who can get at 40 rupees per kg, methanol, by CO2 reduction, I, I bet we'll probably get a Nobel Prize. If you want me to give you a Nobel Prize winning problem, please try that. Not by conventional rule, by CO2 reduction. So methanol, at, at that price, don't say I have come up with a process. Many people wrote, write to me, I have a process, CO2 to methanol. Have you done the costing? It's very, very important. So I will say, yes, computational chemistry can provide a good insight, but the costing has to be done before chemical industries will have a confidence to use them. If industry is not going to use from your publications, because they are putting money. Don't forget it. Okay, so I, I hope I'm able to answer this question. Ooh, I, I said from the quantum computer, the last question, CJ uh, Joseph. I, it has to be. It has probably people tell me it has to be Hermitian quantum mechanics, and I, I told you that's not very easy to do a Hermitian quantum chemistry. Uh, so that would be a very general answer. Uh, I do not know if there is a very special answer that you're looking at, but quantum computer, I must say, uh, is that people know the physics of quantum information through the entanglement. 
I am repeating the quantum computer, building quantum computer is not only a challenge of the physics and science, but it's a challenge of engineering technologies, which I am not expert. So, but the methods uh, which are obviously uh, very popular would be the Hermitian quantum mechanics in a very short answer. Hello? Yeah, I'm not able to hear you. Hello? Hello, yeah, I'm not able to hear you. Any other question is there? Uh, no, no other question. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you once again. Thank you very much, yeah, thank you very much, yeah. Okay, I, I can stop sharing? Uh, yes, please. Thank you.